Lectures on the Politics of God and the Politics of Man, Lecture 4. The Politics of God and the Politics of Man, Part 2. In the last lecture, I said that the Church, as a covenant community, is a political organism, since the Greek word ecclesia refers to a political body. This concept of the covenant community as a political body is confirmed in Scripture in other ways. The Christian community is described in Scripture as a nation. Quote, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people. Unquote. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. It would be easy, given the familiarity of biblical language and imagery bequeathed to Western culture by 2,000 years of Christian history, to pass by this language without noticing anything of political significance in it. And indeed, this has usually been the case. But we must remember that this is a quotation from the Old Testament in which the people of Israel are described in the very same terms. Moses was commanded to speak these words to the children of Israel. Quote, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. Unquote. Exodus chapter 19 verses 5 and 6 According to Ethelbert Stauffer, there is a connection here with the word Ecclesia, and I quote, The church that calls itself Ecclesia means to be neither synagogue nor anti-synagogue, nor yet parasynagogue, but the covenant community of the Messiah, seeing its roots back beyond the age of the formation of the synagogue in the very beginnings of Israel. She intends to revive the inheritance of the Mosaic covenant community, and now at last bring its original purpose to its fulfilment the hallowing of God's name. Unquote. Moreover, Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God, and believers are heirs of this kingdom, indeed joint heirs with Christ. Let us make sure, says V. H. Stanton, and I quote, that we realise the extraordinarily prominent position which the subject of the kingdom of God occupies in the Gospels, more especially in the Synoptists. This is essential if we would form a true conception of the nature of Christianity. Descriptions of the characteristics of the kingdom, expositions of its laws, accounts of the way men were actually receiving it, forecasts of its future make up the whole central portion of the synoptic narrative. Unquote. Likewise, Hermann Ridderboss says that, and again I quote, the gospel by which the entire New Testament kerygma is summarised has the kingdom of God as its coming for its content. It may rightly be said that the whole of the preaching of Jesus Christ and his apostles is concerned with the kingdom of God, and that in Jesus Christ's proclamation of the kingdom, we are face to face with the specific form of expression of the whole of his revelation of God. Unquote. In short, as Archibald Robertson said, and I quote, in our Lord's teaching, the kingdom of God is the representative and all-embracing summary of his distinctive mission, unquote. But the long-established traditions of mysticism, pietism and other worldliness among Christians have exercised an almost blinding influence upon the church's reading of scripture at many points. And this has made it all too easy to forget that a kingdom is a political concept, not a cultic concept. To speak of the kingdom of God is to speak of a divine political order that stands in contrast to the politics of man. Christians throughout the world are not merely members of the various nations who worship the same God in their personal devotions. They constitute a nation in their own right, a distinctive people, called out and separated from the kingdoms of the world and born from above through faith in Christ into another kingdom, a kingdom with its own political order. The form of this political order is absolute monarchy. Regardless of the particular forms of administration under which the monarch's sovereignty is delegated to his ministers in the different spheres of life, that's to say family, church and state, 
The Christian nation is governed by an absolute monarch whose law is unchangeable, whose jurisdiction is unlimited, and whose will is final. His ministers or vicegerents, who govern under his law in the various institutional aspects of the life of the nation, may or may not be chosen by means of elections, depending on the nature of the institution. For example, elections may be used in choosing elders, but such elections have no place in the family. Nevertheless, those chosen by whatever means are bound absolutely to govern these institutions under the will of God as revealed in his law. This applies not only in the government of the church, but in the family and the state also. No Christian politician, chosen by whatever means, or belonging to any particular political party, has any dispensation to serve any other lord. In his work as a politician, he owes an absolute and unswerving loyalty and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Rome recognised the inevitable conflict between Christ and Caesar that this fact created. So did the early church. It is the modern church's failure to recognise the inevitable and exhaustive nature of this antithesis that has in large measure rendered the church so irrelevant and powerless in the modern world. We can put this another way by saying that the modern church has failed to recognise that all political thought and action is inevitably religious, and that since Christianity is a religion it must of necessity have a distinctive view of political order. Had the early Christians been prepared to do what the modern church on the whole seems prepared to do, namely, to restrict the worship of Christ to a personal salvation cult, which is what the various permitted mystery cults were, there would have been no conflict with Rome. But they were not prepared to do this. The conflict was a political conflict because it was a religious conflict. It has been observed by R.J. Rushduni that in Rome, and I quote, the framework for the religious and familial acts of piety was Rome itself, the central and most sacred community. Rome strictly controlled all rights of corporation, assembly, religious meetings, clubs and street gatherings, and it brooked no possible rival to its centrality. One of the reasons for the latter supremacy of the military bodies over Rome was the lack of any organised bodies within the state to provide a counterbalance to the two swollen bodies which became the rulers of the empire, the army and the abiding and growing civil service. The state alone could organise. Short of conspiracy, the citizen could not. On this ground alone, the highly organised Christian church was an offence and an affront to the state, and an illegal organisation readily suspected of conspiracy. Unquote. The early Christians proclaimed Christ as Lord not only with their words, but with their lives also in the way they lived and organised themselves as a community, and in doing this they constituted a distinctive social and political order that was in direct and open conflict with the social and political order of Rome. Very early in its life, says Hugh Fleming, and I quote, the church set up agencies to deal with every sphere of life. They had their own courts, schools, exchequers and hospitals. It was their faith that dominated every sphere of life. To have any area of life outside the lordship of Christ was considered idolatry. The reason behind the violent Roman persecutions of the 3rd century was not religious, but rather that, as the charge read, the Christian church was imperium in imperio, a sovereignty within a sovereignty, an absolute authority within the jurisdiction of another. It was because they were regarded as politically subversive that they had to be destroyed. Unquote. Speaking of Celsus's opposition to Christianity, A.D. Nock observed that, and I quote, both the Christians and their opponents came to think of themselves as a new people, and it is clear in the work of Celsus that his real aim was to persuade the Christians not to forget loyalty to the state in their devotion to this new state within a state. Unquote. And according to Alan Brent, and again I quote, the victory of early Christianity and its success in annihilating its pagan rival both as a political and intellectual force, 
is the victory of a state within a state, an imperium in imperio, which both challenged the state itself and sought, finally and unsuccessfully, to replace it totally. Unquote. We must recognise, therefore, first, that the kingdom of God, the body of Christ on earth, and the Christian ecclesia are political concepts. And second, that the realisation of these concepts in human life and society constitutes a distinctive form of political action. There is a sense, therefore, in which we can say that the kingdom of God is primarily a political order and that the Christian faith is primarily a political faith. Politics for the Christian is not merely one aspect of life among others, but the whole of it. Christianity is about politics. Not only is it the case that for the Christian, politics in this general sense is the primary context of life, it is the case also for the non-believer. Life is primarily political because politics is inevitably religious and has as its entire rationale the administration of the law of an ultimate authority, that is to say a God, in the totality of life. In this sense, therefore, we can say that Christianity is the only true politics. All of the political ideologies are false, that is to say, idolatrous. There is only either obedient or disobedient politics in God's sight. The body of Christ, as the polis, the city of God, whose demos, people, constitute the ecclesia, the body politic, of the kingdom of God, is a political organism. And all other political organisms are apostate and in rebellion against God, their only rightful king, to whom the nations of the earth have been given as his rightful inheritance. Christianity is the true politics, the only true politics. Christianity is primarily a political order because it concerns the kingdom of God, which is the heart of the Christian gospel and which we are commanded to put first above all else. It is important at this point that we understand precisely what is being claimed here and what is not being claimed. First, it must be remembered that I am using the term politics here in a wide sense as a general category for understanding the Christian faith. I am not, at least at this point, referring to a particular form of civil government or to a particular form of the administration of public justice. Second, it has been claimed that Christianity is primarily a political faith because it concerns the kingdom of God, which is a political order because a kingdom is a political concept. However, it is clear from scripture that the kingdom of God is not of this world. John chapter 18 verse 36. There is therefore a radical break, a discontinuity, an antithesis between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of the world. Christ's authority and power are not of this world. In other words, he does not derive his authority and power from the political orders and empires of men. His authority comes from God. But this does not mean that his authority has no relation to the world of politics and the empires of men, that it does not address the political life of men and nations. It does. We are commanded to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10 The source of Christ's authority and power is not in this world, but its object is the transformation of the kingdoms of this world into the kingdom of Christ. See, for example, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The Christian nation or kingdom is not just another political order among the many political orders that exist in the world. It stands out over and against these and is completely different in origin and nature. There is a complete antithesis between the two. Nevertheless, the theatre in which God's kingdom is to be manifested is the world of men and nations, not some vague otherworldly spiritual realm. It is the nations that are to be brought under the discipline of Christ by the preaching of the gospel. Third, there is a fundamental principle of secular humanist politics that demonstrates very clearly the nature of the antithesis that exists 
between the kingdoms of the world, or the politics of man, and the kingdom of Christ, that is to say, the politics of God. In the politics of man, human government takes priority over all else. Man becomes the measure of all things. Man is supreme. This supremacy must manifest itself in the form of human government over all spheres of life. This inevitably leads to totalitarianism and to the denial of human freedom in the name of man, indeed, even in the name of the rights of man. Well did Jesus say, If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. John chapter 8 verse 36 There is no real freedom outside of Christ, only idolatry, and all idols are tyrants that enslave men and crush their spirits. This is no less the case with the modern idolatry of democratic political power, in which man rules himself according to his own law in the name of human rights. This kind of human autonomy from God, that is to say, the proclamation of the rights of man, can only be achieved by denying the rights of God over all spheres of life. Such a proclamation of the rights of man, because it is a denial of the rights of God, is necessarily, in principle, also a denial of all the freedoms that God has given to men and ultimately will inevitably produce a society that in practice denies these freedoms in the name of man as the captain of his own fate. This is a serious problem that we now have to face in Britain. Politics in modern Britain has become a relentless campaign to strip men of their legitimate freedom under God and replace it with state control over the whole of life in the name of human rights that are superficial and ineffective and virtually meaningless to the individual. The antithesis here reaches its zenith in the idolatry of secular humanism, which offers real men, or rather forces upon men, a new kind of salvation, a salvation in which the state, as the embodiment of man's own idea of himself as God, rules over every facet of human life and provides men with their rights and the solutions to all their problems. This is the state as God, the new Rome. Hegel even refers to the state as, and I quote, this actual God. The state, he says, and again I quote, is the march of God in the world. Its ground or cause is the power of reason realising itself as will. When thinking of the idea of the state, we must not have in our minds any particular state or particular institution, but must rather contemplate the idea, this actual God, by itself. Unquote. The only real difference between ancient Rome and the new Rome is the more consistently secularised form in which the new Rome is manifesting its tyranny. Just as the Church organised the faith during the medieval era in Europe, says Shlomo Sand, and I quote, The national state regiments it in the modern era. The state sees itself as performing an eternal mission. It demands to be worshipped, has substituted strict civil registration for the religious sacraments of baptism and marriage, and regards those who question their national identity as traitors and heretics, unquote. This is the religion by which Western societies live today. And yet the body of Christ, the Christian nation, those who are subjects of the kingdom of God, and who therefore belong to a different political order that claims their absolute loyalty, must also live amongst this apostate and rebellious political order in which man usurps the place of God, and whose chief idol, the secular state, is accorded all the attributes of divinity, although in a secularised form. How are Christians to do this? How are the members of the Ecclesia of God, a rival political order, to live among the political orders of men that now dominate society? How are we to live in the antithesis while both maintaining that antithesis and at the same time supplanting the political orders of man with the political order of God's kingdom so that the latter triumphs over and vanquishes the former? How are we to practice the politics of God amongst the political orders of men? The correct response to this question will involve us in a great deal of sacrifice. It cost many of the early Christians their lives. Unfortunately, 
The way that the modern church has dealt with this question on the whole has been either to deny the validity of the question and embrace pietistic withdrawal, or, as with liberalism, to deny the antithesis. Neither approach is correct. If we deny the antithesis or the validity of the question, the result will be that we shall engage in the politics of man instead of the politics of God. This may be self-conscious or unselfconscious, but it will be inevitable. There is no third way politics for the Christian. There is only the politics of God and the politics of man. Either we engage in the politics of God or we succumb to the politics of man. What is the difference? In what does this antithesis consist? Simply in this, that in the politics of man, the state, as the ultimate embodiment of human will, governs the life of the individual and the society to which he belongs in terms of fallen man's own definition of right and wrong, good and evil, a definition that rejects God's word, God's law, as the touchstone of all truth at the outset and replaces it with the pretended autonomy of human reason. In the politics of God, man looks to God as the source of all good and seeks to live in conformity with his will as revealed in Scripture. In the politics of man, the individual and society look to the state as the source of all good. The state provides for man's education, health care and welfare. It provides work, pensions, runs the economy, controls the raising of children in the home as well as outside the home. It is that in which man lives and moves and has his being. The state is Lord. And as Hegel explained, and I quote, it must further be understood that all the worth which the human being possesses, all spiritual reality, he possesses only through the state. For truth is the unity of the universal and subjective will, and the universal is to be found in the state, its laws, its universal and rational arrangements. The state is the divine idea as it exists on earth." Unquote. In other words, the state is the incarnation of divinity, man's true God. Accordingly, Hegel tells us that, and I quote, man must therefore venerate the state as a secular deity, unquote. In the ancient world, this idolatry of the state, the polis, as man's saviour, was sacralised in the figure of the divine human ruler, supremely in the cult of the Roman emperors. The Church rejected this whole political ideology and confessed Jesus Christ as God incarnate, the divine human saviour and ruler, that is to say Lord, whose kingdom is everlasting and to whom all the kings of the earth must and one day will bow the knee, Caesar included. The New Testament writers, says Ethelbert Stauffer, and I quote, radically rejected this apotheosis of human beings, particularly the cult of the emperors. The rejection is expressed in three ways. First, they refused the emperor any sort of divine honours or acclamation. None has the right to claim worship save God and his Christ. Second, the rejection is seen in the names and titles of honour that are bestowed on Christ. Titles taken over from the old biblical tradition and which had become a staple part of the Christology of the primitive church found a new use in providing an antithesis to Hellenistic ideas. New Hellenistic names and formulae were also added to the church's vocabulary. Names claimed for Christ alone and making him a rival to the emperor. Third and last, the Church expressed its rejection of Hellenism in the far-reaching form of interpreting the ancient world's adoration of its heroes, its apotheosis of the Emperor and its expectation of a Saviour in terms of its own theology of history as prophecies and anticipations of Jesus Christ and his saving work. Unquote. The politics of God claims that Jesus Christ is Lord, that is to say Saviour and Ruler, God incarnate, and that we are to look to him as the source of all good and govern our lives and society according to his law. God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, and the one whom we must worship.
With the appearance of the modern godless and God-denying state on the stage of world history, therefore, we have the return of the ancient Antichrist in secular form, since, as Ethelbert Stauffer says, and I quote, Antichrist is the strongest world power in history. In him, all political power is concentrated. In Antichrist, there is the final revelation of creaturely sovereignty, unquote. And the secular state claims complete sovereignty over both the individual and society. In the modern state, man incarnates his own will as sovereign over the world. In other words, man becomes, in the form of the secular state, his own god. Well, what are the consequences? The triumph of secular humanism has led to a complete shift in the way people in British society think, speak and live. Under secular humanism, the control and regulation of life by the state will continue relentlessly. It has to because this is the logic of the idolatry of man as his own god. This is why individual freedom is ultimately an obsolete concept for secular humanism. Even the terminology has now shifted decisively away from freedom to rights. This means that there has been a shift from the real, the tangible, the individual to the abstract and the ideal, which must be embodied in some institution that has absolute control and authority. This move to the abstract is inevitable because individual men disagree and dispute with each other and their rights cannot be harmonised on an individual basis. Therefore, the many, individuals, must give way to the one, the abstract idea of human will, which is embodied in the state. The one and the many cannot be reconciled on the basis of man as his own ultimate principle, man as God. The question, therefore, is this. Can the abstract, the ideal, as embodied in the state, guarantee the freedom of the individual? The answer is that it cannot. In enforcing the rights of one, it must negate the freedoms of another. The state, therefore, must rule as an absolute authority and suspend the liberty of the individual in principle. This is the only alternative to total anarchy for secular humanism. According to Ernst Nolt, and I quote, The word totalitarian, in the sense of laying full claim to and obligation on a human being, is applicable to every religion, every outlook on the world and on life, even the liberal. But only in the eyes of liberalism is this form really purely formal, that is to say, not ultimately concretizable, and hence Kant's categorical imperative is its classic formulation. It leaves religions free, tolerates them, because it does not regard truth as demonstrable or personal freedom as definable. The only reason it is non-totalitarian in the material sense and appears to abandon man to the mere whim of his moods is because, from a formal point of view, it is more totalitarian, that is, more inexorable, than other ideologies. Unquote. But in the West, it appears now that the more liberalism has become disconnected from the Christian cultural matrix from which it originated, the less its totalitarianism has remained purely formal and the more liberal regimes have sought to realise this totalitarianism in concrete social forms and consequently the less freedom the liberal political establishment is willing to grant to Christians in the modern liberal societies of the West. Britain's increasingly institutionalised apathy and even hostility to Christianity and the growing restriction of previously recognised fundamental freedoms stemming from its Christian past are testimony to this fact. It is precisely this trend that gives modern liberal Western states the character of totalitarianism, similar to that of ancient Rome. Ultimate authority has to reside somewhere, and if there is no God then ultimate authority must belong to man. But such authority cannot belong to each man. Ultimate authority is therefore embodied in the state as the realisation of the abstract idea of human will, and the one, the state, takes precedence over the many, individuals, thereby abridging the God-given liberty of the individual. The state, therefore, as Hegel tells us, is its own motive and absolute end, 
and the highest duty of the individual over whom the state exercises a supreme right is to be a member of the state. The state, he says, is, and I quote, the objective spirit and the individual has his truth, real existence and ethical status only in being a member of it, unquote. This is where Great Britain is heading. The increasing control and regulation of life by the state is all part of the religious apostasy of the age, all part of the politics of man. Slavery is the end product of the politics of man. It always has been, and it will be no different in the societies of the Western nations as they increasingly reject the Christian faith. The thin veneer of liberty that we still have in Western society is being relentlessly stripped away by the modern secular state. While under the old order, says Christopher Dawson, and I quote, the state had recognised its limits as against a spiritual power and had only extended its claims over a part of human life, the modern state admitted no limitations and embraced the whole life of the individual citizen in its economic and military organisation, unquote. The consequences for mankind of this idolatry of political power by modern secular states have been immense, from the reign of terror unleashed by the French Revolution to the mass murder programmes of national and international socialism. Leaving aside those killed by the two world wars, over 100 million people were murdered in the 20th century alone by secular states in pursuit of the religious ideals of secular humanism. This is a fairly conservative figure, though not the most conservative. Gil Elliott, writing in 1972, estimated the total number of man-made deaths in the 20th century up to that point, including both world wars, between 80 and 150 million, and assumed a mean figure of 110 million, with the World War I accounting for about 10 million, and World War II accounting for about 40 million deaths. A more recent conservative estimate, again, including both world wars, has put the total number killed by the state in the 20th century at 188 million. A less conservative estimate puts the figure at 231 million. According to Jung Chang and John Halliday, the Chinese communist state alone was responsible for over 70 million peacetime deaths under the leadership of Mao Zedong. Alexander Solzhenitsyn claimed that a similar number perished in the Soviet Union. Commenting on state activity in the 20th century, Paul Johnson writes, and I quote, The state has proved itself an insatiable spender, an unrivalled waster. It has also proved itself the greatest killer of all time. By the late 1990s, State action had been responsible for the violent or unnatural deaths of some 135 million people during the century, more perhaps than it had succeeded in destroying during the whole of human history up to 1900. Its inhuman malevolence had more than kept pace with its growing size and expanding means. Unquote. Likewise, Niall Ferguson states that, and I quote, the hundred years after 1900 were without question the bloodiest century in modern history, far more violent in relative as well as absolute terms than any previous era. Unquote. The secular humanist state has been responsible for more deaths, both in war and as a result of the various secular humanist inquisitions and witch hunts carried out in the 20th century, than any other form of religious establishment in history. In 1957, only halfway through the 20th century, Denis de Rougemont stated that, and I quote, the wars of this century killed more men than all other wars of our history, unquote. Even the Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm acknowledged that the 20th century was, and again I quote, an era of religious wars, though the most militant and bloodthirsty of its religions were secular ideologies of 19th century vintage, such as socialism and nationalism, whose god equivalents were either abstractions or politicians venerated in the manner of divinities. Unquote. 
The modern secular state has proved to be the most brutal and murderous form of political rule that the world has ever seen. Every idol, however exalted, said Aldous Huxley, and I quote, turns out in the long run to be a Moloch hungry for human sacrifice, unquote. From the Christian perspective, things are very different. Christianity teaches that the Creator is one God in three persons. There is, therefore, no contradiction between the one and the many in the Godhead. God is a triunity. The one and the many are equally ultimate in the being of God. The one does not take precedence over the many and vice versa. Only in the triune nature of God's being can man find the answer to the conflict between liberty and authority that has plagued the politics of man throughout history. Without the triune God of the Christian faith, the politics of man is doomed to a never-ending conflict between the one and the many, authority and liberty. Only in Christ can man find true freedom, individual liberty and at the same time the necessary legitimate authority to guarantee political order in society. Only in the politics of God is there an answer to this age-old conflict between political authority, the one, and individual liberty, the many. All other attempts to solve this conflict have failed or are failing with untold human suffering as a consequence. As the one in whom all authority and power in the created order is concentrated, the Lord Jesus Christ delegates his authority in a limited way to subordinate institutions, church, state and family, that have specific functions in his kingdom. No one other than Christ himself and no subordinate institution possesses ultimate authority and power. Christ alone has all power and authority. Only the politics of God recognises the rights of God and the responsibilities of man towards God and his fellow creatures, while at the same time guaranteeing the individual's true liberty under God and the necessary political authority to maintain order in society. Only by practising the politics of God can man reconcile individual freedom with political authority and thereby establish peace. Liberty and peace are the product of the politics of God. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 to 7 We have become so familiar with these words one way or another that we miss their meaning. The government of the nations rests on Christ's shoulder and all nations are under obligation to recognise this fact and bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who refuse to do this and reject Christ's government have perished and will continue to perish. British society will be no different. The writing is already on the wall. End of Lecture 4